so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode deals with issues of self-harm and suicide. If this is triggering for you, give this one a miss. And if you need to speak to someone, reach out to Lifeline on 13 11 14. Six days after the death of her boyfriend, Conrad Roy, in 2014, Michelle Carter sent a text to her friend. I just had it all planned out. Now I have to do something different. Maybe something better. I just don't think that that's possible. He was my person, you know? It was a quote copied almost word for word from the television show Glee, a show starring a bunch of American teenagers who all belong to their school's singing club. It wasn't the only exchange 17-year-old Michelle copied. The smart, somewhat quirky American teenager herself loved that show. She drew inspiration from the lead character Rachel Berry and the actress who played her, Leah Michelle. Because just like the Massachusetts teenager, Leah had lost her on- and off-screen boyfriend Corey Monteith to suicide. They were both grieving the same thing. Except in Michelle and Conrad's reality, their relationship was so private Neither of their families knew they were even an item. It was a relationship that had blossomed almost exclusively on text. Thousands of them, sent over years. They were texting the night Conrad drove into a Kmart car park, alone, in Fairhaven, an hour's drive from where Michelle lived in Plainville, and took his own life. It was the conversations they had that summer night that led to one of the most intriguing criminal cases in recent American history, a crime that became known as the suicide texting case. I'm Gemma Bath and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with political theorist Dr Mark Tunick about the now infamous texting suicide case of Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy III. So let's start here. How did Michelle and Conrad actually meet in 2012? Michelle's grandmother and Conrad's great aunt both live in Naples, Florida, and they both happen to be vacationing there. And um, I didn't know this, but there's this new Hula TV series, The Girl from Plainville. And according to that series, Michelle's grandmother set them up at this tennis court so that she introduced the two of them. And that's where they met, just happening to be vacationing in Naples, Florida. And what do we know about Conrad's life prior to meeting Michelle? He had some troubles, but he had some good things. I mean, he had two younger sisters. He was good in sports. He played baseball and did some other activities. He earned his captain's license. He would work with his family's marine salvage business. And so sometimes he would be at sea for three weeks. And he enjoyed that. But like I said, he had some troubles. Um, His parents were separated for three years. He would get into some fights in school and about four or five months before the day of his suicide, which we haven't talked about yet, his father struck him in the face hard enough to send Conrad to the hospital. And so Conrad had some serious mental health problems. He had been in a hospital for mental depression. He tells Michelle um, in a text how he really hated hospitals. And he was on Celexa. And he had tried to kill himself a few times, including before he met Michelle. Michelle herself had some mental problems. She had an eating disorder. She was on antidepressants. And she indicates in one of her texts to Conrad that she had tried cutting herself in the past. Let's focus on Michelle for a second. Was she liked? Did she have friends? Was she happy in her life prior to meeting Conrad? I don't know anything about Michelle prior to meeting Conrad. What I do know about Michelle comes from texts. So they had a a text relationship. And literally, there were over 4,200 texts just between Michelle and Carter that became part of the public record. And those texts really start when she met Conrad, who also went by Coco. Now, Michelle, she did have some other friends that she texted. The the TV series and some other movies that were made about her and Conrad talk about how she had this um, female friend, and maybe she was bisexual, um, she was exploring her sexuality. One of the things that really is interesting about the case is, though, when you look at her motives, the prosecutor tried to explain why would Michelle want Conrad dead. 
because they were friends for, for close to two years. And one of his theories was that Michelle wanted attention from her friends in school. And she wanted sympathy. She wanted to have them hug her. And that's their theory. I'm not sure it's entirely convincing and that motivated her. And, and I think when we look at all of her texts, we get a, a different picture. But there is this idea that she was starving for friendship. She wasn't fully accepted and she was doing what she could to get more friends. Before we move on to Conrad's death, I would like to touch more on their relationship. They spoke on text, you know, thousands of thousands of times, but they actually only met about five times in real life. How would you describe their relationship? You've obviously studied those texts in detail. One of the things that struck me was it looks like Michelle really loves Conrad. She repeatedly says, I love you. And Conrad sometimes says he loves Michelle back, but he's also on many occasions more distant. One of the most important points I want to emphasize is that from 2012 up until a month before Conrad did kill himself, Michelle tries to help Conrad, lift him up, try to help him seek out help because Conrad expressed depression and how he was miserable. He expressed how he wanted to kill himself many times. And Michelle, for a long time, tried to, she invited him to come to McLean Hospital where she was getting treated for, for her disorder. So she was doing a lot to try to help Conrad, but it was really bearing down on her. And we'll see that in the last two or three weeks, especially, Michelle starts encouraging him. And it's not that she wants to see him dead, but she sees how unhappy he is. And several times they talk about how he would be happier in heaven. When police pulled into the parking lot of a Kmart in Fairhaven, Massachusetts, on July 13, 2014, what did they find? So, in the early evening of that Saturday, Conrad, who was you know, almost 19 years old, he parked his pickup truck in this Kmart parking lot, and he had rigged a water pump in the back seat because he intended to, to kill himself. And he hesitates, and he gets out of the truck, and he calls up Michelle on their cell phone. And they talk twice at length. And during one of those conversations, Michelle says to Conrad, get back in. Now, what we don't know is, did Conrad immediately get back in and then die right then? Probably. But there is a theory, and this was printed in a, in a local newspaper that interviewed Joe Cataldo, who was Michelle's attorney. And he said that Conrad was reported missing by his mother. And it hadn't been 24 hours yet, but she was worried. And apparently, the police drove by that Kmart parking lot at 3 a.m. Sunday morning, you know, after Saturday night, and didn't see anything. And so Cataldo maybe is trying to suggest, well, maybe Conrad, after that phone call with Michelle, which ended at 8 p.m. on that Saturday, his cell phone probably died at 7.58 p.m. to be precise. Maybe Conrad didn't get right back in or, or shut off the pump and drove around because the police didn't see him there at 3 a.m. And then he came back and he did kill himself in that lot. But that's, that's speculation. And it could be that the police drove by at 3 a.m. and they just didn't notice the pickup truck. But that's what happened. Conrad got into the truck and killed himself. He died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And how did Michelle kind of come into this? Because his family didn't really know anything about her or her contact with him, but she had been in contact with him, close contact with him for the days before he died. As early as October 2012, which would have been you know shortly after their trip to Naples, they're texting. And Conrad's revealing how he tried to kill himself. And then in later texts like in, in June of 2014, a month before he actually kills himself, he repeatedly says, I kind of wish I didn't exist. Every time I get depressed, my mind takes over and I want to kill myself. He explains how he tried water intoxication. He tried overdosing. There's one interesting exchange. Conrad says to Michelle, he thought about jumping off his boat. And Michelle says, that wouldn't do anything. And Conrad says, I know, I'm stupid. And Michelle replies, you're not stupid. You're lonely, but you're not alone. Now, that text is an example of what was going on for a 20-month period. And I can give you lots of other examples where Michelle texts Conrad, stop, don't kill yourself. Come to McLean Hospital with me. You'll find the light someday. So she's trying to dissuade him from killing himself. And in, in, in a famous exchange, it's really sad, but Conrad suggests to Michelle that they be Romeo and Juliet. And Michelle at first responds, I'd love to be your Juliet. It shows he, she really cares for Conrad. Conrad's response is, you know what happened to them at the end. And then Michelle replies in all capitals, oh yeah, F no, we're not dying. 
So she's harshly rebuking Conrad. It's not like she's encouraging him at this point. Conrad says at one point, just like three weeks before he killed himself, I'm thinking about harming myself, to be completely honest. And Michelle replies, don't. Because once you start, it's like impossible to stop and you get scars. I have scars. What is harming yourself going to do? Nothing. It will just make it worse. I love you. And she offers her advice. Just uh, do something that makes you happy. Look at an old photograph and remember a happy moment. Listen to music. Look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself you're worth it. These are the sorts of things that she says in some of those texts as late as June of 2014. But those texts do change, don't they? Because in those final days, they really changed in tone. Dramatically. And this is what's troubling. And this is what troubled the prosecutors is that starting maybe the beginning of July, Michelle starts encouraging Conrad to go through with it. She gives advice. She gives suggestions about different ways. They both research together different ways to kill yourself that would be successful. There's one text in, in particular that I really think is striking. July 4th of 2014, Conrad says, it's going to happen, meaning he's going to kill himself. And Michelle says, tonight. And Conrad says, eventually. And then Michelle says, and this is what the news media quoted in all capital letters. See, that's what I mean. You keep pushing it off in capital letters. And then she goes on to say, you just said you were going to do it tonight. And now you're saying eventually. Now, when you look at that text with the big capital letter C, you keep pushing it off. It sounds like she's angry with him and trying to push him to go ahead and do it. But if we look at the entire text and not just that snippet, what happens is Michelle says, are you going to do it tonight? Conrad says, eventually. And then Michelle says, cute. She makes a happy face. She says, ha ha, I love you. And then she says, see, that's what I mean. You keep pushing it off. So in that context, even in July 4th, it's not like she's pushing him to go through with it. She's trying to point out that maybe Conrad doesn't really want to die. A few days before, she said, can I change your mind? One of Michelle's excuses for these texts encouraging Conrad is she said, and the prosecutor did not believe this, she said he, she was trying to call his bluff. Maybe she could get him to hurt himself bad enough that he'd go to the hospital, but not bad enough that he would you know, really succeed. And then there's another point where she says she was using reverse psychology. She texted her friend a week after Conrad died. And she said, um, I read this thing online about trying to agree with a person and this will change their mind because they see how stupid they're being, but it didn't work. So she tries to give some explanations for that. The problem is that is not at all persuasive if we look at the 24 hours before Conrad died. And this is what's really troubling. And this is what created outrage in Conrad's family members and probably motivated the prosecutor to pursue a charge of involuntary manslaughter. So I have these texts, so I can, I can quote some of them. At 428 in the morning, the morning of the day where Conrad goes to the Kmart, Conrad says, I really don't know what I'm waiting for, but I have everything lined up. And Michelle says, you keep pushing it off and you say you'll do it, but you never do. You're just making it harder on yourself by pushing it off. You just have to do it. Do you want to do it now? Conrad says, is it too late? I'm going to go back to sleep. Love you. I'll text you tomorrow. But Michelle doesn't just go away. She says, no, it's probably the best time now because everyone's sleeping. Just go somewhere in your truck. You just need to do it, Conrad, or I'm going to get you help. If you want it as bad as you say you do, it's time to do it today. And Conrad says, okay, I'm going to do it today. Michelle says, do you promise? And Conrad says, I promise, babe. I have to now. Like right now? Conrad says, well, where do I go? Michelle says, and you can't break a promise and just go in a quiet parking lot or something. Then at 6.20 p.m. on that Saturday, Okay. But the prosecutor's theory is that Conrad died at 8 p.m. in the Kmart lot. At 6.20, Conrad texts Michelle, leaving now. Michelle replies, okay, you can do this. At 6.25 p.m., Conrad texts, almost there. At 6.28 p.m., Michelle says, okay. That's the end of the text exchange. At 9.19 p.m., Michelle texts, please answer me. I'm scared. Are you okay? I love you please answer. Conrad parked his pickup truck in the Kmart and he, he got out because he was hesitating. 
he was running the water pump. So carbon monoxide was being generated and he gets out of the truck and he calls Michelle. Now, according to the phone records, they spoke twice from 628 to 710 and from 712 p.m. to 758 p.m. And the theory is that Conrad's cell phone went dead at 758. Now, we don't know what they said on the phone because there's no record of that. The only record we have of what Michelle said to Conrad is a text that Michelle sent to her friend, Samantha, a couple of weeks later. And this is when she says to her friend, I could have stopped it. I was the one on the phone with him and he got out of the car because it was working and he got scared. And I told him to get back in. I could go to jail. And that snippet of that conversation is what ABC put out on their 2020 episode that aired in 2017. But they left out some parts of the text, which may lead some people to look at Michelle in a somewhat different light. So let me just read the complete text. She says, I couldn't have him live that way. And therapy didn't help him. Whatever I said, I knew I couldn't change his mind. Like, I didn't think he was actually going to do it. But you're right. He was just going to do it another time. I know he's finally happy. I just couldn't stand to see him like that anymore. I told him he'd be free and happy in heaven. She stayed on the phone for 20 minutes with no response from Conrad. She heard a motor running the entire time and the phone disconnected at 7.58. And what's odd is after that, Michelle called Conrad 28 times. And also, as I related, she texted him that she was scared and asked if he was okay. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with Dr. Mark Tunick about Michelle Carter and her involvement in the suicide of Conrad Roy in 2014. After Conrad's death, Michelle played the role of grieving girlfriend. She was in the lives of his family. She was organising fundraisers. Like, she was playing that position and his family didn't really know her, did they? His family didn't really know her and her family didn't know him. They had this like relationship. Like you said, they only met probably five times over two years. So it was really text and they don't share their text with anyone. But without these texts, the police would have just assumed that Conrad with his history of depression and maybe the fact that his, his parents didn't get along and his father struck him and he was having trouble in school, he killed himself. But it's only because of these texts, which the police found out because um, Conrad's laptop was handed over to the police after he died. And then from this laptop, Conrad had deleted a lot of texts, but they got a search warrant for Michelle's phone. And that that presented everything. And it's because of these texts that they pursue the charges. So in February 2015, so seven months after Conrad dies, Michelle's arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter in connection to Conrad's death. Can you explain to us why that was so significant for the American legal system, a charge like that? Yes. And, and first of all, it's important to note that in Massachusetts, it's not against the law to commit suicide. And there's no law against assisting someone or encouraging someone to commit suicide. So really, Michelle didn't break any law. She still morally should have sought out help, you know, call someone, call 911. And she didn't do that. But the law doesn't punish people for being morally bad. We only punish people, put them in prison. And Michelle could have faced 20 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. We should only do that if they violated a law. And there is no law against assisting in suicide, but there is a law against involuntary manslaughter. So there are two paths to involuntary manslaughter. You can be charged with involuntary manslaughter if you fail to take actions to prevent someone from risking death, if you had a duty to take those reasonable steps. And so Michelle heard Conrad outside his truck with a pump running producing carbon monoxide gas. She knew that he was trying to commit himself and was in danger of doing so. She could have called 911. She didn't. She committed manslaughter by omission by failing to prevent Conrad from from harming himself. The problem with that is by the law, it's only a manslaughter by omission if you had a duty to intervene and you didn't. And according to the law, a lifeguard has a duty to save a drowning swimmer. And so if a lifeguard doesn't save the drowning swimmer, that could be involuntary manslaughter. A police officer has a duty to help people in their custody, but there's no duty to aid a friend or a lover. But then there's manslaughter by commission. And that's what she was charged with. 
That's what she was convicted with. And manslaughter by commission is an unlawful homicide where you cause the death of someone unintentionally caused by wanton or reckless conduct in which it is likely that harm would result. So there's two elements of manslaughter by commission, conduct that caused the death. And so the prosecutor argued that Michelle's texts in which she encourages him, she says those last couple of weeks, just do it. She gives him advice about how to do it. Plus, especially the words, get back in. The prosecutor argues that's conduct that caused Conrad to kill himself. So the argument is Michelle caused Conrad to get back in the truck. She coerced him. He did not get back in that truck by his voluntary free will. And that was the argument. It raised this question of, can words really kill? Can someone kill someone by their speech? And so everything boils down to whether Michelle caused Conrad or whether Conrad was predisposed. And the judge did find her guilty. Can you walk us through that judge's decision? So the judge, Judge Monis, said that even though Conrad rigged the pump himself, and it's not like Michelle assisted in the suicide. Michelle was an hour's drive away the entire time. So she didn't help him buy anything. She didn't help him set up his truck or anything like that. Judge Monas agreed that Conrad rigged the pump himself. He recognized he had a history of depression. He tried to commit suicide before. But the judge said that when Conrad got out of the truck, the slate was wiped clean. He broke the chain of self-causation. And then Michelle's instructions to get back in the truck caused him to do that. He said that Michelle overbore Conrad's will. She effectively coerced him. And then when it went up to the Supreme Judicial Court on appeal, the Supreme Judicial Court also said that Michelle coerced Conrad. She overwhelmed whatever willpower the 18-year-old victim had. So that's the crime. It's manslaughter if her conduct caused him to die. And that's what the court ruled. Now, you could face up to 20 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. The prosecutor's office actually recommended a sentence of 7 to 12 years. The defense countered by recommending probation. And then the actual sentence was 15 months in prison and 15 months on probation. And that's what Michelle got. They appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but the U.S. Supreme Court didn't have any reason to take the case, and so they didn't hear the case. So Michelle's out. She's keeping under the radar, and she will be finished with her probation in August. I read a news story where um, when he learned that Michelle got out early because of good behavior, Conrad's grandfather was disgusted. It's such a complicated case. Do you expect this area of law to keep evolving? Obviously, text exchanges, the online world, it's, it's the world we live in now. Do you think this case did or has, because it has been a few years now, set a precedent? One thing that's happened is the Massachusetts state legislator tried to resolve the problem of having to resort to involuntary manslaughter. I think they realized that it was troubling to you know, say that someone's words could cause someone else's suicide because there are free speech implications to that. What if someone writes an essay in favor of euthanasia? Okay, you're in pain, there's no cure, it's irreversible, you're suffering, and someone defends that in words, and then someone reads that essay and uses that to kill themselves. Can the person who wrote those words be blamed? The thing is, and this is something I gathered reading all the texts, I don't think Michelle had that power over Conrad. So there are some texts, like a week or two before Conrad killed himself, Michelle says she wanted to come over to Conrad's, but he never replied. So she texts, I guess I'm not coming over then. And then Conrad says, I'm the worst I've ever been. And Michelle says, do you want to come over tomorrow? Please. I have the best idea. Oh my God, you need to come over. Please, can you? And Conrad says, no, I'm busy. And Michelle says in another text, you say you want to hang out, but when the time comes, you don't want to. And Conrad says, I'll hang out Monday. And Michelle says, not tonight. Conrad says, no, sorry. But then listen to this. Michelle says, ha ha, love you. Conrad replies, I know. Michelle says, say you love me. Conrad replies, you love me. So these exchanges cast doubt. The judges were assuming 
in, in finding her guilty of vol involuntary manslaughter, that she compelled or coerced Conrad, that she had power over him and she overbore his will. But these exchanges suggest that Conrad was maybe the one in control of the relationship, that Michelle didn't really have power over him, like they're suggesting. Dr. Mark Tunick is a political theorist who teaches courses on political theory, law and ethics at Florida Atlantic University. His book, Texting, Suicide and the Law, lays out the case against Michelle Carter and the intricacies of the legal case against her. You can find a link to it in our show notes. We've also linked an article about a similar case that's currently happening in Geelong, Victoria, where a young woman was charged with encouraging her boyfriend to kill herself. She has avoided conviction. The case also inspired the brand new series The Girl from Plainville, starring Elle Fanning, which is streaming now only on Stan. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. Send us an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au or join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join. <laughs> <laughs>